This is Marco Reus. This is Shinji Kagawa. This is Nuri Shahin. Hello, this is Jaden Sancho. And you're listening to the Yellow Wall podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 340 of the Yellow Wall Pods. I'm your host Stefan Butzko and today we will talk about a rare win in Hoffenheim, Champions League embarrassment and we will preview the Revier Derby. For all that and more joins me the blessed <laughs> Lars Pollmann. Hello Lars, uh, what, what a great time to have you back on the show. How are you doing? Thanks Stefan. Uh, not for a lack of my want that I've not been on in, in a few weeks but I think you... We're quite busy, so you made it easy on yourself, and I think we can all appreciate that from time to time. Uh, yeah, I'm obviously super excited to talk about these magnificent Dortmund performances, like vintage Klopp era type of performances, uh, which we should take at least two hours to dissect, please. Yeah, I'm thinking more about three hours, to be honest. But uh, no, in all, in all seriousness, uh, you're right. This uh, wasn't the, the best week, at least uh, in, in European terms. I mean, Dortmund haven't won in Hoffenheim since 2012, which uh, basically means that the last time Dortmund won in Hoffenheim or Sinsheim, uh, Gio Reyna was about 10 years old. So um, yeah, it's been a while. But uh, before we dive into... Uh, these games and dissect them more or less. Wir sind komplett schuldenfrei. Wir zahlen keinen einzigen Euro an Zinsen. And this episode is sponsored by Kai Hansen, who, and I think this is a first, delivers happy birthday wishes to his siblings, Anders and Karen Hansen. So happy birthday, uh, also from me. And uh, last, you also want to wish them a happy birthday, or does does the bug not stretch that far? I mean, now that you've set me up, I kind of have to say no, but. You know, happy birthday, wherever you are. Sounds maybe Danish. I don't know any Danish, so I can't say it in your language, but happy birthday nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I don't, uh, uh, for, due to privacy matters, I don't actually look up where people live that uh, support us. But uh, nevertheless, thank you very much. And uh, I think we are recording this today on the 22nd, and that's uh, when their birthday is. So uh, I'll make sure to publish it before the end of the day. So, um, yeah, happy birthday again. And if you want to sponsor an episode, go to patreon.com slash for more information. And now, Lars, uh, it's time to talk about that game in Hoffenheim, um, which started without Arling Haaland. Marco Reus Haaland uh, was rested after playing about 286 minutes in three games for Norway during the international break, including 120 minutes versus Serbia. Um, it wasn't the prettiest of games, yet Dortmund came out victorious. Um, what were your takeaways from this? Well, my main takeaway is I don't remember a thing outside of the goal. So that's obviously the, the perfect introduction to a lengthy discussion on this podcast. Uh, yeah, I mean, the takeaway whenever you win at Hoffenheim, which doesn't happen for Dortmund, as you said earlier, is always three points and don't look back uh, on how they came about because clearly this wasn't a game for the ages. I think a nil-nil draw would have been thoroughly deserved for everyone involved, including us idiots watching the game. <laughs> um, I mean, not really much to talk about, I guess. Uh, selection... Obviously, a lot of drama ahead of the game, as usual, when whenever Lucien Favre makes any kind of decision. Hmm. Actually, the only interesting bit to me wasn't resting uh, Holland after international exploits and noise because, you know, he has uh, too much of a history to be playing every single game. Um, was uh, Marvin Hitz staying in goal? Because, obviously, Roman Bürki isn't uh, part of the Swiss national team any longer. Hasn't been for a few years, actually. Neither has hits. And, you know, the pulmonary infection or whatever it was that kept Birki out ahead of the international break. I'm not necessarily sure a goalkeeper is out for four weeks or out of the starting lineup for four weeks with, with, with you know, an infection 
that allows him to be on the bench because as a goalkeeper, theoretically, you have to be able to play 89 minutes coming off the bench. So you might as well start the guy if he's in, in your squad. So that didn't make sense. And especially didn't make sense when uh, Hitz was still in the goal uh, for the Lazio game, which we'll talk about later. And um, in typical Lucien Favre fashion, he's evaded every potential answer as to what exactly he was thinking there <laughs> because I think we all agree that while Marvin Hitz is a decent number two he's not better in any way shape or form than Roman Berkey uh, I don't know that necessarily Berkey would have done better in these last few games don't think Hitz did poorly but you know one thing that did come back to me now that I was talking about Hitz was that after four minutes he should have uh, basically given away a goal to uh, Gacinovic, I think, of Hoffenheim by way of poor positioning. Uh, and yeah, that was basically the only real chance Dortmund faced and Hitz wasn't involved in that. So I don't know that the goalkeeper discussion is one that we should have, but I mean, Favre has opened it up needlessly. So I guess we, we ought to talk about it. Well, you just knocked off a healthy hour, a healthy half hour of discussion from this episode last, but uh, yeah, um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, yeah, Favre, I think in the uh, pre-game press conference to the Schalke game was also a little bit evasive about whether Berkey will play or, or not. A little, little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so yeah, evasive. Teeny, teeny, tiny Favre a bit of <laughs> evasiveness, yeah. Yeah, so evasive, he might uh, be nominated to su to the Supreme Court next um, in the United States, but uh, yeah. Um, I think I don't know if I if, if I agree with the assessment that it should have been a scoreless draw. I mean, the expected goals were one by Dortmund to the two point three to one point zero. Uh, Hoffenheim really didn't have too many chances, uh, any that I would recall, to be honest. Um, so yeah, it was kind of almost obvious that uh, things would start to happen once uh, Dortmund brought on Haaland and Ro Royce and. Uh, Happen it did, um, but uh, after 20 minutes, Lukas Piszczek had to come off for um, after being poked in the eye by uh, was it Stefan Posch or was it Dennis Geiger? I don't remember exactly who it was, but uh, yeah. Um, so Thomas Eleni slotted back in, uh, in into the back line as a as a left half back, I think, or was it a right half back? I don't know. I think they switched it around, right? So um, uh, what what did you make of this performance of uh, the Danish? Uh, central midfielder uh, basically morphing into a Sven Bender role? Unsurprisingly, given the example of Bender and even to an extent Julian Weigel, uh, I, I think these defensive-minded, relatively uh, football-intelligent players, I don't think it's too big an issue for them to deputize in the back line now and then, especially against the Hoffenheim side that was missing Andre Kramaric due to COVID reasons. I mean, the entire uh, complexion of the game would have been much different had he been available for Hoffenheim, seeing as arguably he's the second best Bundesliga player in the moment after, or, you know, the best non-Bayern player, perhaps. Um, so, yeah, he did really well. Uh, Delaney did. He played on the left, I think, the entire time, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, he had a lot of good in interventions, was a bit lucky uh, with a couple of refereeing decisions that could have put him <laughs> in a bind uh, with a with an early booking. Yeah, but that's classic Delaney. He is a very good uh, successor to Sebastian Kehl in that regard. I find that his uh, tackles are often very much on the edge of uh, legality. I mean, if there is a shithouse in Dortmund, uh, it's definitely Thomas Delaney, and I think he would be proud of me saying that, so that's all right. Uh, yeah, I think he, as I said, he did, he did pretty well. Uh, Hoffenheim didn't really asked too much of him which you know was a good thing all, all things considered and also uh when we talk about Delaney's performance I think we also have to mention Emre John who I would say was probably the best player on the pitch uh and and them two together uh with you know solid old Mats Hummels as usual when the attacker isn't too fast for him as Chiro Immobile was for <laughs> some strange reason uh yeah that that was the the backline to Dortmund's success in this game. Obviously, uh, just want to quickly mention now that you've referenced the, the expected goals. Uh, I don't know how many of those Dortmund amassed before the first goal, which was a gift of Hoffenheim. So when I say it should have been a goal of draw, that was basically on the assumption that Dortmund wouldn't have been basically gifted the first goal. Obviously, then things opened up for them, I think. 
uh, both Royce and also Haaland could have, should have scored a second goal to make it simpler. But I think until the first goal, you know, I, had it been a goal of draw in the end, I don't think anybody would have been really able to claim that Dortmund did enough necessarily to win the three points. Yeah, I think uh, that is a very uh, correct assessment. Um, just uh, quickly back to Delaney, because uh, Adam Dorowski, uh, also panelist on this podcast, uh, tweeted after the game uh, about Delaney that he had five tackles, all leading to Dortmund possession. He had 11 clearances, second best was four, and he won eight out of nine aerial duels. Uh, most won aerial since Schmelzer in... 2-1 uh, loss to Stuttgart in November 2012. <laughs> uh, Delaney also had uh, two interceptions and 75 touches, which is the second most on the team in just the 70 minutes he was on the field. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, his header also led to the goal. I think he just sort of headed it forward and then just landed kindly. Is that correct? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So before we now move up to third place in the table behind RB Leipzig, who currently are on 10 points, and uh, Leipzig are still unbeaten. Bayern, meanwhile, are second with nine points, same as Dortmund, but have the better goal difference. Um, I don't know, should we talk about Felix Paslak in this game, or should we just leave it at that, because uh, there are a couple of stats about him where he led the team, for example, most touches, uh, most successful pressures, Uh, highest uh, passing, ac not accuracy, but but volume, I guess, uh, most attempted passes and uh, most progressive carry yards and so on and so forth. So, And I think 13 recoveries, also leading the team there and also with tackles. So uh, for him, overall, a very good performance. Again, uh, thanks to Adam, who highlighted that performance. I, I think I should briefly mention that. Um, last but otherwise, I think we can move on now. Um, this wasn't the, the highlight match where we should dwell on too long. Um, so, yeah. Um, so the uh, 3-1 loss in the Champions League felt kind of embarrassing, but also felt kind of normal because Dortmund play like that quite often in the Champions League. Um, Twitter user at FFS Mattis, or for fuck's sake, Mattis, who... Uh, like me, is carrying the curse of following both Dortmund and the Sixers, uh, wrote on Twitter that Dortmund uh, won three out of their last 15 away games, uh, which were against Prague, Monaco and Bruges, and uh, the last time Dortmund won against a semi-decent opponent away from home, he finds it was probably against Arsenal about seven years ago. So, um, last with that in mind, um, this performance in Rome really was not uh, anything out of the ordinary for Dortmund uh, in, on European uh, level. But at the same time, um, I, I thought it, it was particularly poor considering that Lazio themselves, at least in my view, also didn't have their greatest game. Yeah, I mean, when in Rome, <laughs> uh, embarrass yourself, apparently. <laughs> That's how the saying ends. Um, I oh, mean... Man. Oh, Lazio, I, I, I made a point of talking them down uh, around the draw, and I still stand by that. I don't think Lazio are any special side. They, they have a couple of really good players in uh, Immobile, obviously, Miniku Savic, uh, who didn't do too much against Dortmund. But uh, generally speaking, I think they were, as we said at the time, one of the easier draws that were available to Dortmund. I mean, Dortmund could have been uh, put in the same group as Atalanta, which, you know, playing away at Atalanta, the way Dortmund are doing uh, on the road in the Champions League, that would be a bloodbath. So uh, that was certainly something on, on Tuesday night, you know, where once again, all the problems Dortmund have were kind of laid bare by a side that, you know, just isn't all that. I mean... When, when you compare it, for example, I obviously, as an Inter fan, watched uh, Gladbach at Inter uh, a day later. Uh, Inter are a better side than Lazio, and Gladbach are a worse side than Dortmund, but they had the much better game plan. Uh, they better mentality. I don't know if we are allowed to say that M-word here. Yeah. Yes, um, we are. <laughs> And and they got a result, and I mean they they almost nicked the game. They hadn't they didn't have a, a shot on target in the first half, or a shot altogether, I think. So uh, 
this is really emblematic of all the stuff we've been talking about at least for three years, maybe even longer, especially after International Nights, but also after, you know, away games to Bayern, which are obviously a bit special, but, you know, other games here and there, basically at least five or six times a year where you know after five minutes that this is one of those nights where Dortmund just don't show up. And, you know, that was the and case. And have confirmation uh, after six. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't even know when the when the first goal was scored, but you could you could basically tell that something like that was already coming after the first few moments. And it's it's really it's it's hard to explain in a way and also not hard, hard to explain. I mean it is hard because Lazio, as we said, aren't all that, you know, super talented team. They don't have Champions League experience, most of these guys anyway. Uh, and they have had a torrid start in Serie A. They were beaten uh, by three goals away to Sampdoria uh, before facing Dortmund. Dortmund had that encouraging win in some sense uh, at Hoffenheim. They are the much better side. They have more Champions League experience. But when you don't show up and, and think perhaps that just having more talent on the pitch will sort itself out and don't have a real plan, you know, what to do with all that talent, uh, then this is the kind of result that you will uh, repeatedly get as Dortmund, as we've seen last season, as we've seen the year before, as we've seen at times under Tuchel and certainly under Bosch and Stöger in the Europa League and even under Klopp sometimes. So I, I, a lot of talk obviously now centers once again on, on Lucien Favre, but it's certainly an issue that runs deeper than the first guy on the co on, on the bench. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's um, kind of weird that, you know, Dortmund basically looked like the surprise Pikachu meme whenever the opponent presses them a little high. And um, I mean, especially in the first five minutes, Lazio overall weren't really that aggressive to me. I mean, they most for the most time defended in a lower block, but in the start, uh, at the start, they at least, uh, yeah, went for it a little bit. And uh, I mean... I've said this a million times on this show, it almost does not um, matter who is playing in these positions, but when you press Dortmund's uh, right side, uh, Dortmund sort of struggled to build up the game. I don't know if, if that's a weakness in positional play, kind of must be, or or just in, in general, a hard position to combine yourself out. Um, Meunier then obviously playing the terrible pass and uh, a couple of seconds later uh, Immobile uh, confirms the curse of the X and puts the ball past hits. Um, obviously not the greatest game of Thomas Meunier uh, who was probably also signed uh, with the promise of having someone with experience and someone that m may not make these mistakes but exactly that's what he did. And uh, yeah, overall Dortmund really not looking sharp in, in, in these moments. Um, I think Marco Roy said after the game that they sort of napped through the first half. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, Lars, I don't really have too many explanations of why um, Dortmund uh, looks so timid when uh, the going gets a little tougher and why uh, this, this routinely and, and repeatedly happens. Um, you know, there are a million factors for why that can be, but I, I just cannot really um, analyze or dissect or put my finger on any, any one of these things. I mean, there might be, um, you know, I think Favre talked about um, the fact that Dortmund need to fight harder and uh, that uh, they <laughs> uh, need to be uh, more present in, in challenges for the balls the, in the in the ball winning department they they were sort of lacking uh, Michel Zorc I think said that they were sort of uh, adhering to the social distancing guidelines when they were out of possession so I mean and I think you tweeted that uh, Dortmund sort of only press uh, very individually and uh, only when uh, players up front are sort of instructed or guided by a, a center back or so this is this is something that annoys me uh overall very often that uh, you don't really see any coherent pressing and uh yeah it's is also something that really where Dortmund make things hard, harder for themselves because uh, I like to think back of the second half of the super cup where Dortmund actually um, for the first time in a very long time, showed phases of coherent pressing, but this is so, so rare to to be seen that uh, you can't really think that it's uh, really a strategy. And uh, I mean, in that scenario, Dortmund were two 0 down and had to do something. 
Um, would be kind of nice to see this sort of behavior uh, from from Dortmund. Uh, yeah. Uh, more, more frequently I mean you have a lot of young players uh, that can play a pressing style system obviously it'll be a bit harder with Axel Witzel maybe but uh, Jude Bellingham can certainly participate and uh, your fullbacks certainly can as well so Lars um, I don't know if, if I'm if I'm ranting into the, the wrong direction here but uh, um, what do you make of Dortmund's pressing slash lack thereof and how do you think this can be fixed Or will it be fixed under favor? Or do you think a coach like Jesse Marsh also would have to come in for, for Dortmund to, you know, get a little bit more advanced in, in that category? I mean, if Favre can be talked into sticking with the back three, even though he's only got one central defender available to him, then he could certainly be also talked into, you know, not going like full court press, but... Uh, <laughs> But but maybe in like shifting his line up or lines up by like 10 meters or so, which already would be a bit of a help just to, you know, tighten the spaces. But also then again, uh, I think he knows the lack of pace he has in defensive areas uh, with basically everyone outside of Emil John at the moment. And even he wasn't available against Lazio. So uh, I, I can understand that he doesn't want to uh, risk a high line, which you know, even Bayern had problems with before Hansi Flick took over. But generally speaking, I think this is just, you know, the identity of a Favre team is not a pressing machine. And I think there's certainly an argument to be made that Dortmund would be better served with a more aggressive approach. I think that's also something that would help the players show more, you know, desire, if if we want to call it that, or have have just a more uh, a more aggressive you know, footballing culture, which I think would really suit having a young team that hasn't really won too much. Uh, most individual players outside of like Hummels and even someone like Axel Witzel. I mean, he's not played at a huge club, Dortmund are the biggest club he's been, he's been at, uh, arguably. I mean, you could obviously debate with uh, Benfica, who are a Portuguese powerhouse, but Generally speaking, I would say that he's a guy that hasn't really won much, so he he's he's not entitled to being you know full and and sometimes we say that's about uh, players in Germany, meaning they are you know no longer hungry for success or whatever. The Dortmund don't have these players; they they don't have that excuse. So, to me, it would make sense to adopt a as I said more aggressive footballing culture and and. I think maybe this is just painting with too uh, broad a stroke, but I would say that there's a lack of uh, winning accountability at Dortmund. I don't think there's too many people in 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 the team and even in higher up positions that are really <clears throat> sorry uh, that are you know after a defeat that can't sleep at night and and come back to work with like ten percent more more intensity or whatever. I mean. For all we can say about Bayern and obviously their systemic advantages over Dortmund, I think when when they don't play well, they really work hard to make things right. And when they don't play well in the first half, they will play much better in the second half because there's like a, a, a storm of emotion in the, in, the, in the dressing room and there's many players that will stand up and hold each other accountable for playing better and ultimately winning games. And I think success breeds success and Dortmund just don't have that kind of mentality in too many positions. I think, as I said, this is probably a bit too broad for the, the, the Lazio game in, in isolation. But well, I, I, I introduced the segment by rattling through the, uh, the the long history of Dortmund not playing well in the Champions League on the road. And I think uh, this this also holds true for too many Bundesliga away games. So I, I think it's it's more than justified to talk about this now. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to go for, basically. I mean, if this was an isolated incident, you could always say, well, you know, it's it's different times. No fans available for all these games. They've been isolating so much. They've been away on international trips and whatever. But, you know, A, that's true for all the teams, basically, at the top. And, and B, uh, they've known it for months now. And C, this isn't an isolated incident. So... 
uh, I think we need to take like a broader approach to things because if we always think about these uh, incidents as isolated, then you can always find an excuse, but making excuses doesn't make you better. Uh, I think, as I said, you need... Dortmund would probably be best served with kind of a culture change. I don't know how many uh, changes you can make without, you know, going to the heart of the power structure, which is obviously something that is very difficult to do in any uh, uh, point in time, and especially during, you know, a global pandemic. But I think just from what we've seen over the last certainly two and a half years with Favre in charge, and even before then, I don't think you know, we can say and or we can look at Dortmund's general development over the last half decade or so and, and say they are going into the right direction if we are talking about them, you know, winning as as much as they can instead of, you know, being a place for kids to develop and, and selling them at good prices and, and kind of having that culture associated with you, which is obviously fun and, and, and nice also. I mean... Uh, it could always I, be I, worse last, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'd rather watch them develop great talents like uh, Jaden Sancho, Jude Bellingham, even Usman Dembele when he was there, than, you know, going with like the inter, inter approach of signing Arturo Vidal and Alexander Kolarov and having multiple 30 something year olds uh, in their team going for one title and then the band dis breaks up. And, and that's not a fun either, but. I think there's no uh, denying that Dortmund aren't as successful as they could be even with Bayern available in the Bundesliga. Yeah, it's very true. I think uh, just from, uh, you know, if you look at the squad on paper, there's just so much potential. And I think I tweeted after the Lazio game that it's, uh, um, you know, sort of surprising to me that this ensemble of players can be this dull um, because... Uh, they could be really exciting. And even if Lazio plays in a low block in a Champions League game, which uh, is very much their right to do, especially as, as you know, they do not deem themselves as the favorites. Um, uh, yeah, that uh, Dortmund can still do a little bit more. The, the one thing, um, or not the one thing, but a stat that really annoys me is um, that Dortmund uh, were caught zero times offside. I mean, yes, let's say we're playing with a low block, but it also indicates just that um, Dortmund are currently not really seeking uh, too many passes behind the back line of the opponent. And uh, I think especially when you have players like Arling Holland or uh, Marco Royce, who is usually famously offside, <laughs> um, that that you have players to run into that space, even if that space is tight and, and narrow. So... Um, uh, it's it's something that really annoys me to to see that too many times Dortmund's attacks are decelerated and obviously I'm looking there at Axel Witzel but also at others that uh, it just takes too long to progress the ball forward. Um, uh, we have talked about this issue before, especially with the Augsburg game and such, and uh, we have all said that as the season progresses, this uh, thing might or will probably fix itself. But uh, yeah. Uh, Still, I think especially when uh, a team is out there just to defend, uh, to defend and and hit you on a counter attack, then uh, you should really make sure to to move the ball a bit more quickly. Um, last, but uh, you at the same time correctly predicted after the game that uh, Lucien Favre would talk about uh, being patient. Um, do you think that uh, me being annoyed? with uh, Dortmund not playing the ball fast enough and maybe with a bit more risk, uh, a bit more prone to lose possession um, and Favre preaching patience like eight times in every interview. Uh, do, do you think that this sort of affects the psychological aspect of players that they rather step on the ball and turn around and play it uh, lateral than uh, trying to get behind the, the back line? Do you think that there's a correlation there? I mean, I don't expect Lucien Favre to be good enough of an actor to put on a persona in front of the camera. So when he says, you know, patience, uh, as you said, eight times in, in an interview, I would assume that is, that's also something that he preaches towards his players. And to an extent, that obviously makes sense because that's just, uh, you know, his, his idea of football is, you know, a certain aversion to risk and 
trying to get the, into better shooting positions. And, and, you know, this is how Lucien Favre basically broke the expected goals model back at Gladbach. Like, patient uh, build-up, trying to get into good shooting positions and not allowing, uh, you know, the opposition too many high-scoring chances by virtue of, you know, losing the ball. Uh, so I would assume that he's also saying the same things more or less to the team, which is obviously uh, basically going back to what we said earlier, that, you know, that it would probably be better for this collection of uh, individual talents to have a more aggressive approach that, you know, makes use of their youth and inexperience in a way, uh, you know, maybe... Maybe that maybe Dortmund would be better served uh, going for four three wins than two one wins or one zero wins if that makes sense. So, um, as, as as you said earlier, I think the the perfect uh, embodiment of you know Farfa's philosophy in that regard, but also what we have discussed as their problems is Axel Witzel because you know. He's a safe pair of hands in midfield, which is fine and dandy, but sometimes you don't want a safe pair of hands. You want a quick driver. So I don't know uh, that he's ever going to drop Witzel, who's basically always playing, even when he's been on international duty, duty with Belgium and playing uh, three times in the starting eleven or two times. I'm not entirely sure this time around. Uh, but, you know, if 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 I were the coach... And and especially now for like the Revier derby, uh, the the first two things I would do is take Witzel out and take Meunier out. Meunier because he's completely out of his depth at at this point. I think he needs a, a mental break more so than a physical break. And Witzel because, uh, as you said, he basically slows everything down to an extent that you know isn't necessary in 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 my opinion. It would be. Uh, just very interesting to see uh, John in defensive midfield, even though he's now a full-time center back. Uh, or I would even put Delaney in there ahead of Witzel, especially if, which is obviously what we need to expect, uh, the, the back three is still a thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, in uh, Rome, Witzel started next to Bellingham. Bellingham, I think, became the fourth youngest Englishman to debut in the Champions League or something like that. No, the youngest. Nah, uh, that 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 was a, a stat. I think Opta tweeted out, but it was wrong because uh, uh, Midland Niles, I think, was younger when he debuted for Arsenal and stuff like that. So um, yeah, that that just wasn't a, a correct one. So uh, yeah, I don't think Midland Niles was in the first team of Arsenal when they won the Champions League, though. That might be a European competition, but not the Champions League. Yeah, I don't know. I, anyway, I, anyway. <laughs> uh, be it the youngest or fourth youngest or whatever. Um, so obviously he was taken out at halftime, but uh, nevertheless, what do you make of this partnership? Do you think it, it works? And uh, where can uh, both improve? You've already talked a little bit about Witzel, but uh, what can Bellingham do better? Or uh, what what did he do well? Um I don't know that he did too much well. Obviously, as a 17-year-old in your first Champions League game in a non-functioning team, I don't want to say dysfunctional necessarily. I don't know that we can expect, even though he plays in central midfield, uh, him to have too much of an impact. But still, I think, uh, unlike a few others, he at least threw himself into battles. He tried uh, you know, to win back possession and, and whatnot. So I think... Uh, on paper, he's already their best uh, midfielder in some ways because he's the most complete. Um, but certainly, you know, he's you see inexperience and you also see when uh, the other players aren't working or, or functioning as, as you know, they should or could. I think he, he definitely needs, you know, a stable system surrounding him, which then elevates his uh, immense individual talents. So when you think back to the start of the season, for example, against Duisburg in, in the cup, the entire team basically worked well and Bellingham was one of, if not the best players on the pitch. So I think with the right support structure, he's already very important. But when that support structure doesn't really work, uh, you know, you see inexperience and maybe, uh, you know, a lack of football IQ that 
isn't you know innate to him but just you know down to not having been in many situations he's now facing yeah yeah i i would agree with that i mean he was taken off at halftime for uh Giovanni Reyna, who did things a little better, but uh, I mean, he got the assist for Haaland, but uh, otherwise wasn't, uh, you know, really changing the game too much either. I mean, Dortmund, after they scored the the uh, one goal, the consolation goal in the end, I think they, they had a period of dominance where they arguably should have punished Lazio for becoming a bit too passive themselves. Like I said before, I don't think that Lazio played that well. I mean, the pass over Dortmund's backline in the end uh, that led to the 3-1 was a really nice goal and hard to defend, obviously, with the lack of pace that Dortmund have, but also just a, a very well uh, created goal. Um, I, I have to say that that was just uh, very efficient and uh, n nice, nicely crafted, but uh, otherwise it's not like uh, Lazio could really put too much pressure on Dortmund and... Um, yeah, usually a better team would come at least with a draw away from it. I mean, it's this loss is by far not the end of the world. I still think that Dortmund are likely to win all their three home games, so that would probably amount to nine points. And if you then uh, win one game away from home, which they've done before in Bruges, for example, then uh, that would be about 12 points that I think should be enough to take the win, especially as I expect uh, opponents uh, in this group take the points off each other. I mean, uh, Bruges did in the end win in Zene, which is maybe a little bit of an upset. I don't know. Um, but uh, just just to name one example, <laughs> the one example we can name so far. Um, but yeah, so it's 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 not great for Dortmund and uh, we really should expect better, especially also from uh, players like Marco Reus and uh, Jaden Sancho, who we didn't really see that much of. Uh, in in this particular game, and I also don't think we've seen much from from Sancho overall this season so far. Um, so yeah, there there are a couple of uh, areas of improvements just on the individual stage, but uh, overall, I think the point stands that collectively that wasn't good enough. Um, but last, as we transition to the Schalke game, I think it was Favre himself who basically said that uh, some played well and some didn't. And uh, especially in the context of uh, tracking back and, uh, you know, defending with a bit more aggression, which uh, reminded me a little bit of the uh, Bosch era where um, Peter Bosch's pressing, at least according to their own account, uh, um, after they were sacked, uh, didn't really work because not everyone on the team was convinced or, or really wanted to run that much. Do you think that uh, a similar problem is... Uh, uh, live now in this Dortmund team as uh, Favre may or may not have alleged I'm not entirely sure uh, if if he really means what he says or if it's just a little bit uh, uh, you know uncarefully worded uh, I'm not I'm not sure but uh, I, I think this is at least something we should pick up real quick because uh, you know it's it, it would be very devastating for Dortmund if, if that really was true that uh, some of the players uh, are, let's say, less uh, involved and, and motivated than others, which is obviously always the case, but, uh, you know, not not to the point that a coach really highlights it. Well, I don't think he did, for one. Um, I'm not even sure the, the quote you, uh, you quoted was even given in that context, but I think, uh, as you said, you know, there's always degrees to which that is the case and you know an attacking player like uh, Jaden Sancho uh, he's not supposed to be tracking back as hard as you know a Meunier when he's in attack because you know he's supposed to develop his creativity and, and focus on attacking obviously while still doing his part which I couldn't honestly say anyone purposefully didn't do you know because they didn't want to or didn't care enough uh so i'm 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 struggling to you know try to reconcile that that argument that i'm not sure anyone actually made all right cool then i'll just cut it out <laughs> 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 um yeah okay so we'll, let's just move on to um the dortmund schalke game aka the Revier Derby, um, which will probably be attended by 300 fans after the coronavirus cases are 
continuously on the rise in Dortmund and North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, obviously, no away fans will feature in this game. And uh, yeah, after I think about 11,000 people attended the Gladbach game at, or uh, what, what am I, the, the Freiburg game, I'm sorry. Uh, after more than 11,000 people attended the home match against Freiburg, um, yeah, it's it's kind of sad to see this number drop so rapidly uh, for the derby, which is obviously the late kickoff. Um, since there are not that many fans, uh, I think the DFL made the decision that uh, uh, they can go ahead with a sort of night game. Um, for this game, obviously, Akanji, Jan, and Hazar, at least according to Favre, are back. Uh, Akanji has uh, overcome uh, his uh, COVID-19 uh, spell and uh, I guess is now testing negative again. And uh, still out are uh, Dan Axel Zagadou, Marcel Schmelzer, and Nico Schulz, who picked up an injury on international duty. Um, I'm still not entirely sure uh, what kind of knee injury Zagadou has and why he is out for so long and why there's not exactly a timetable of, of his return. Um, but uh, I, th I think we've become used to it now that Dortmund are very vague on uh, any diagnosis. And uh, if they give one out, it's often also just turns out to be wrong. So, um, yeah, so there's that. Uh, Personnel-wise, uh, Schalke will have to do without Suat Serda, who is injured, and Oshan Kabak, who is suspended. Uh, I guess Salif Sané, if fit, will... Uh, probably uh, replace Kabak in defense. Um, yeah, so last Schalke obviously um, are now in 17th after gaining their very first point this season against Union Berlin in a one all draw, which uh, really felt more like a second division game than a first division game, if I'm honest. Um, it wasn't pretty at all. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't see the full game. I was tuning in and out because I, I was... Uh, um, painting <laughs> so uh, it's it's not like i i can give you in-depth analysis of that game but uh, you saw a lot of long balls and a lot of uh, i don't know uh in german we say standfußball so a lot of times players just not moving around just very static and uh, not a pretty game at all to watch also not too many scoring chances um yeah so this Schalke team obviously arrive at the westfalen stadion on Saturday with the epic scoring, uh, with the epic streak of uh, 20 games winless. Um, so naturally, this should be a very easy win for Dortmund, right, Lars? Um, it might be. I mean, <laughs> we, we can basically uh, uh, replay the episode we did in May because that was also a ghost derby, if you like. Schalke had already not won in 10 or so games, I guess, or maybe like eight or nine. Uh, they hadn't yet made the coaching change, but everybody was kind of uh, in the know that David uh, Wagner was a dead man walking and should have been replaced in the summer, as I'm sure uh, regular listeners will have heard probably by Matthias at some point in on, on, on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously... Everyone in Germany is going for the, you know, in, in Derby's form doesn't count angle. Even Naldo, the Schalke assistant coach now, which is still a very weird thing to say and think of, <laughs> uh, did the same uh, today in an interview with uh, a German TV channel. And, you know, this will be talked about the entire build up to the game that, you know, form doesn't matter in Derby. Well, that's, and a, that's that good it's... news, Lars, because looking at the last three performances by Dortmund or, uh, you know, if you count the Augsburg one, I mean, Freiburg was a bit better. But uh, in, in that regard, Dortmund's form isn't really on the up. So that's good, right? I mean, if, if you were talking about Schalke playing uh, on the level of a second division side, then Dortmund are playing on Bayern's level at the moment. So, <laughs> um the 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 thing is obviously to some extent derbies are special games because obviously i mean maybe maybe they aren't without you know the hype uh, with you know fans in the stands and negative or positive affirmation uh during the game from the outside uh maybe that does change so much about derbies but in theory you know, the, the big rivalry and the opportunity to basically turn your season on your head if you're Schalke, that does count for something, I think. 
but you know, I don't know if that's enough to overcome the the monumental gap in quality that the two teams just have at the moment. And it's not even at the moment. I think if he, obviously Schalke would be a bit better if uh, Kabak and Zelda and and I think Mark Wood is also at least questionable for the game. Yeah, he's touch and go. Yeah, if if they had those three guys, then you know Schalke would be a better side. But they still don't sit at the same table as Dortmund in the restaurant. So. Uh, if if things go normal, uh, <laughs> I have to ask what restaurant. <laughs> at the moment, a very cheap one. Um, I mean, at, if things go go normally, Dortmund should be able to win this quite comfortably. And as I said before, in in May they did. I mean, they had a field day against Schalke. Uh, Holland scored early on, and that was basically that. There was no upset on the cards and. I wouldn't be shocked by any means if the same happened again on Saturday, but as is the case with these particular fixtures, you know, there's always that that tinge of doubt in the back of your head that maybe Schalke can pull something out of the head to, as I said, turn around their season. And, 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 you know, that would be uh, quite interesting from a Dortmund perspective, obviously, because uh, I think if they lose against this Schalke side, then there will be, you know, full on discussion about Farfel. But like right now, you actually don't have the opportunity to do anything about that because you are uh, you're you're playing two more Champions League games until the next international break. So uh, you're not going to see a coaching change uh, unless your team's completely tanking. And, and I think we couldn't say that about Dortmund, even if they did lose to Schalke. Yeah. Um... I I don't recall uh, Manuel Baum's record against Dortmund. I think he has. Uh, he he must have won against them at some point with Augsburg because they. Yeah. They always shit the bet. Yeah, they they did actually in uh, in uh, 2019. It was a two one win for Dortmund, but other, every every other game with Augsburg, he either lost or drew. So um yeah, I just put it up. Uh, he played Dortmund. As a coach, six times, and uh, the most recent game was a two-one win for him. But otherwise, uh, yeah, two losses and three draws. So, um, yeah, it's it's not it's not a boogie side coach for for Dortmund. So let's put it this way. Um, yeah, what what do you make of this coaching change? Um, I, I I don't know in in what category to put Manuel Baum. You know, he's. It's not a coach that really overly impresses me, but maybe he's someone that uh, whose ingenuity flies a little bit under the radar because he's at uh, teams that I don't particularly take a closer look. Uh, he's Tesco to the Tesco, in my opinion. Like, uh, you know, a bit of a darling in like the nerd tactics community, but, you know, ultimately doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that has full command of like the dressing room uh there's a reason why after augsburg he wasn't really in the mirror for any big jobs he was coaching the under 20s and now under 18s of the german fa so that's not even a high profile job in in terms of the youth national teams because obviously the more important ones are the uh 17 19 and 21 teams um so I think he was kind of emblematic of what Schalke had available. Like they, they could have obviously gone for someone who knows the club uh, as in like Mark Wilmots, but you know, he's been an international coach of Belgium and Iran, if I'm not mistaken, and not been too successful at, at, at either of those spots recently. So I think they really didn't have, or they, they did have pretty slim pickings and they went for someone that, uh, Jochen Schneider, the sporting chief, whatever, of Schalke, uh, knows fairly well on a personal level. So that that was that. And I, I this if this game came down to something the Schalke coach did, that would really surprise me. Yeah, that's true. I mean, um, what we can say about uh, Schalke is that uh, um, they're... They have a couple of decent players in their team. I think I I personally rate Paciencia quite highly, and I'm not entirely sure why Frankfurt would loan him out. I mean, uh, you could see even in the games where Schalke has severely struggled that um, at least he had a couple of uh, clean first touches and uh, you know looks f 
from a technical standpoint, uh, miles above everyone else. And uh, I'm sure uh, if there's a threat um, coming out of the Schalke team, it's probably Paciencia. I'm not entirely sure what kind of role uh, Ibizovic is playing at this point. I mean, Skripski, I think he has scored a couple in, in his past against uh, Dortmund. Um, but yeah, it's it's not like this this team is something where Dortmund really have to fear too many things. I mean, I mean, Harit is is also back. I think he was subbed on against Union Berlin, so um, he's probably going to start. But um, yeah, this Schalke team right now really um, is not good in in many categories. I mean, we were complaining in in Dortmund uh, terms about the Lazio game and and other performances, but uh, this is still miles away from where Schalke are right now um, because there's really no coherence, there's no position play. Yes, they they might press a little bit more aggressively, but their pressing uh, isn't isn't really too gripping either. It's a lot of things just rely on coincidence for Schalke. And uh, yeah, defensively, they're so often out of shape and unorganized. It's, 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 it's almost funny, or maybe it is funny. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. But uh, yeah, I don't. I don't think this uh, this Dortmund team, whoever will play, um, should have too much trouble to overcoming this team. Um, I've I've said it in the past before derbies, and then uh, crazy stuff happened. But uh, this time, I really think, especially without the crowd, uh, um, that that Dortmund probably will have a similar performance as uh, the last 4 nothing win against Schalke. I don't I don't know if it's going to be a similar scoreline. I mean, Bayern pounced them 8 nothing on the first match day. Um, that was probably a bit harsh, but <laughs> um, yeah, these things can happen. Schalke is a team that can easily fall apart. So, um, yeah. Um, so, Lars, you've already said that uh, if it were you on the coaching bench, you'd probably drop Witzel and probably... You, you didn't specify it, but I assume you would put in uh, Paslak for uh, Meunier or, or would you play Hazard in that position uh, in, instead as the right I wing back? I uh, didn't, even, didn't even think about Hazard. Um, no, I would uh, prefer Matteo Morel. Ah, yeah. I think <laughs> that he was on the bench uh, against Lazio and that would indicate to me that he can play at least like 45 to 60 minutes. And I think his uh, creativity would add something to the team. Uh, he's also more aggressive, uh, you know, in counter pressing and whatnot than certainly Meunier. Uh, and, and I think a bit more secure, uh, in terms of like positioning than, than Azar. But, you know, I think it's unlikely to happen. Uh, I would assume that it's still going to be Meunier and Witzel and sticking by, you know, the, the guys he believes in after poor performances uh, with, you know, the usual sprinkling of uh, rest for presumably one off, not both uh, Reus and Holland with uh, Reina coming back to the starting 11 and obviously Akanji and John replacing Delaney and Pischek, I would assume. Yeah, that's also my assumption, to be honest. Um, I, I wonder what we'll uh, see of Julian Brandt, uh, whether he'll come on as a sub or not. Um, so so far, he hasn't really shown too many things, uh, too, collected too many arguments for why he should play, um, unless you have a disagreement there. Um, yeah, I, I don't I don't foresee him starting on, on, until... Uh, the rotation machine is kicked a little harder. Uh, I don't know what what your opinion is on there, but uh, right now I mean, I he 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 already started games this season, so uh, that it certainly uh, seems like right now he's more of a rotational piece. I think we've talked about the streakiness of one Julian Brand over the last how many months is he here? Like eighteen or so? Not quite. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we all know how good he is. We all know that he's not always that good and that he's usually at his best when he has a run of games in like his best position, which <laughs> I guess is true for most players. But uh, right now Dortmund don't want to, because I don't think they can't uh, afford the luxury of giving him that run of games. So yeah, I mean, 
I'm sure there's going to be a run of injuries and Brandt's back in the team and suddenly everybody remembers why he's like one of the best playmakers in the Bundesliga. But until then, he's going to be a relatively useless, if we want to be harsh, uh, kind of super sub. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, I could actually foresee, you know, if if they're both on their game, which is a big if maybe, but um, uh, stick him next to uh, Bellingham actually and uh, have Bellingham uh, do the enforcer part a little bit more and uh, you and Brandt obviously the creative part if you play against teams where you know you will have a lot of possession and where you know you will uh, need to break them down and uh, you know so this this could be a game where I could uh, go with a very offensive minded uh, midfield because uh, why not I mean uh, Dortmund have str- you know do struggle in the ball winning department one way or another doesn't matter who plays if they're actually not uh, trying to win the ball hard enough so you know from that perspective why not just throw in players that at least on the ball can do something with it um, yeah, maybe, maybe that's a little bit too easy and a bit too simplistic, but, uh, you know, this actually would be a game where I would maybe throw in Brandt, put him next to Bellingham and, and see what happens. Um, I mean, if, if things go very awry, then, uh, you can still correct it since, uh, you have five substitutions, even though I think against Lazio Favre only used three. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, talk about everything else after the game because uh, I don't know how much else there is to preview because Schalke are so terrible. I think according to who scored, the only strength they have currently is protecting the lead, which is unfortunate because in the Bundesliga they are yet to take a lead. So, um, yeah. Uh, Lars, if you want to go ahead and uh, predict the Revier Derby, uh, please do that now. I, I, I'm really struggling to see how who scored come up with that because obviously the last Schalke lead uh, was in January because they haven't even played the cup fixture because of legal reasons with the Bavarian amateur club that is facing them but uh, digressing no longer I'm going for a 3-1 Dortmund win yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm just going to predict the same scoreline as the last meeting. I think Dortmund will win this 4 nothing again. So, um, yeah. Just just hoping this, this will be a very... Um, a, a, a very calm game from Dortmund fan perspective and a game where Dortmund do not pick up any more unnecessary injuries or muscle injuries and whatnot considering uh, the schedule... So uh, I hope they can breeze past Schalke without uh, taking too much of a toll. So that's that's uh, really what I'm hoping for. Anyway, um, Lars, I think we can knock it on the head now. Um, please tell our listeners uh, where to follow you on Twitter. I don't know if you have uh, left private mode again or not. I have. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Lars Polman. Very well. You can follow me at Stefan Butzko on Twitter and you can follow all of us at Yellow Wallpot on Twitter and Facebook. If you want to subscribe to this podcast, please do that via YouTube, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify and all the other podcatchers, the RSS feeds you can find along with our written content on the yellowwallpot.net. And if you want to become a sponsor and... Uh, Wish someone a happy birthday, then uh, go to patreon.com slash the yellow wall for more information. And uh, we shall be back uh, after the Schalke game and then uh, take a look at the midweek game. And uh, yeah, so more on that later. I'll keep you all posted until then. Uh, Stay safe. And as always, thank you for listening. Goodbye.